Hello and welcome everyone. This is a series called Courageous Conversations Over Coffee and it's sponsored by the South Coast Interfaith Council. Thank you for joining us today for uh, what I think will be an eye-opening, heartwarming, perhaps even myth-busting experience. And above all, a chance for all of us to be challenged, enlightened, and inspired. My name is Marietta Fong. I'm a member of the board of the council, and I belong to the Rolling Hills United Methodist Church here in the South Bay area of Los Angeles. And today, we'll be talking with Jose Osuna, who is the co-founder of Restore Inc. in Long Beach, California. So we'll hear a bit more about Jose and the other co-founders, Kyle and Miguel, and the work that they're doing in a few minutes. But first, we'll have a few tips from Cheryl, the council's office administrator, about conducting a successful meeting on Zoom. Cheryl? Thanks, Marietta. All right, so um, like you said, we're, we're Zooming today. And so we'd like everybody to uh, remain on mute just so there's no uh, interruptions on the, the conversation. If you want to ask any questions, um, you can either chat them to Marietta or you can go to the uh, reactions menu down at the bottom and you can raise your hand. Um, you are going to, we are recording today. So if you uh, want to have the best uh, presentation of yourself on camera there it's best to have a light on in front and no light uh, from behind and even though we've been doing this for over a year now zooming is always an adventure so we ask for your patience so thank you and Marielle I'll send it back to you okay um, Cheryl do you want to talk about upcoming events now or at the end of the program we'll do that at the end Okay, good. So thank you, Cheryl. And um, I'll, I'll also add, if most of you know by now, because we've been living on Zoom for a year, that there's a speaker view and a gallery view. So if you want to look at the person who's speaking in a, with a bigger picture, it's up usually up in the right-hand corner. So the program will be about 45 minutes or so. And first, we'll have some general questions and conversation. And hear the story that Jose wants to tell us. And then during the Q&A section near the end, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, as Cheryl said, via the chat that's located at the bottom of your screen. And I'll share those with Jose, or you can raise your hand if you want to ask something directly. So today we have the privilege of talking with Jose Usuna who is a co-founder of Restore Inc. in Long Beach. And according to their website, and I think we can put that in the chat. Cheryl, if you want to put it in the chat, you can. If you can't find it, I'll help you with that. But Restore I, Inc. I'll do that. Okay. Is a community founded on kinship and support for formerly incarcerated and gang impacted individuals and their families, seeking to empower them through a process of healing and rehabilitation so that they may make a positive impact in society. And I learned that the three restorative breakthroughs, breakthroughs that they found are identity, narrative, and kinship. Jose was the former director of external affairs at Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, California. And many of us know about Homeboy Industries. It's the world's largest gang rehab and reentry program. With nine years of professional experience there, Jose oversaw communications, community outreach, and public and government relations. Proudly serving as Homeboy's Director of External Affairs, Osuna led Homeboy's Employment Services Department, as well as their solar panel training and certification program. Previously gang involved since the age of 10, Osuna served 13 years in prison and suffered the death of a son killed by gun violence. So these personal experiences are the driving force behind his commitment to serve the gang impacted and formerly incarcerated. 
Jose, we are really grateful to you for spending some time with us today. And I'll mention that you had a great conversation several months ago with Sarah Dean, the immediate past president of the South Coast Interfaith Council. So Cheryl, if you can, please put a link to that in the chat. And then okay. maybe either now or near the end of our program so people can listen and learn more about your personal background and journey. And today, let's focus on your work at Restore Inc. and the story of how and why it was started in your co-founders, Kyle and Miguel. So maybe you could start by telling me about Kyle and Miguel. How long have you known them? <laughs> Well, I'll start off with with Miguel, and um and and Kyle happens to be in the meeting, so I have to tell the truth about him. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I'll start off with Miguel. So you know, Miguel, I've you know, first of all, I, I got jumped into the gang. I got initiated into the gang when I was nine years old, and that was a cycle that was repetitive in the neighborhood that I grew up in in the Washington middle school uh, neighborhood area. And so when, when Miguel Lugo, um, one of the other co-founders, uh, Restore Inc., was nine years old, 10 years old, um, I was part of the group that initiated him into the gang. So we actually were, were part of the same gang um, here in Long Beach um, for a really long time. And you know he ended up going to prison, I ended up going to prison, and we both ended up at Homeboy Industries. I ended up there, you know, quite some time before Miguel. Um, he had uh, just served 18 years on a triple life sentence that he had um, gotten out uh, as a result of, a, of an appeal. And he found me at Homeboy Industries um, when he was released from that, uh, from that sentence. And we started to work there with Father Greg Boyle. And I ran... Eventually, I ended up running what's called the Global Homeboy Network, and that's Homeboy Industries kind of, um, it's, it's external network, it's partnership network, but it's also the vehicle um, through which the organization provides a lot of technical assistance to other organizations that want to be in some form uh, similar to Homeboy Industries. And, you know, that's kind of how I met Kyle. Um, you know, he had moved to Long Beach um, and he had ended up in, you know, unknowingly, he had ended up in a, in a very gang impacted neighborhood over in the, in the Drake Park area um, of Long Beach. And so as a result of starting to build relationships with some of the gang members in that neighborhood, um, something happened to Kyle, something moved inside of him and, and, and he found himself called to, to serve that community, he made his way to Homeboy and, they told him when he got there, you're from Long Beach. There's a couple of guys here from Long Beach. One of them says, Jose, you should talk to him. And that's how Kyle and I started our friendship and, and our relationship. And when I left uh, Homeboy, you know, Kyle was actually my very first client. I started a consulting business here in, 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 uh, in Long Beach. He, he still owe me a dollar, by the way, Kyle. Um, you know, and, and he told me, I, I want you to help me. Um, start something here in Long Beach. And so, you know, I, I put on the consultant hat and I did that. And, and I think we got about as far as we were going to get with me as a consultant. And somewhere along the line, Kyle saw in me, you know, a partner. And so he asked me to, to join him in the work and, and, and in building out the idea that he had had in his mind. And I, I agreed with one caveat, which was I wanted to include Miguel. Um, and that came after a conversation with, with Miguel where he told me, you know, you know that that's really something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, I really wanted to, to give back to the community being Long Beach um, that I came from and that I really hurt in many ways. And so it's kind of messed up if you and Kyle do this and don't include me um, because then, you know, what chance do I have in, in, in really doing anything? <laughs> And so I, I went to Kyle and, and, and he said, sure, why not? You know, um, he knew he was going to get uh, outvoted on every vote we would ever have to do, but he was willing to take that ride with us. And, and we've been on a journey now, you know, um, we've been on a journey um, for a few years where 
um, this idea has started to gel and become something real for us in, in a very small way, you know, um, but it's really is about more than forming an organization. It's really about building a community, which is why we call ourselves. Um, we don't believe in seeing the folks that we get to work with as clients. Um, you know, I'll refer to folks sometimes as participants, but really they're community members. You know, and 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 they're and they're part of a community that that we're really trying to embrace and bring to the rest of the community, and so that's the way I look at at the folks that 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 we get to to work with and, and serve in, in some kind of way, um, you know, which like I said is is is, is minimal right now um, because we're a very young organization and and the whole nonprofit world is is very fickle, and and we're we're taking our time. We want to do things right. And, um, and we want to understand that we have limitations too. But that's, that's the answer to your question, how, kind of how things came together for Kyle and, and, and Miguel. Miguel's still at Homeboy Industries. He's the head of their security over there. And so, you know, he, he, uh, he's the one that's leading our, 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 our speaking circles. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how we, we ended up on this, on this crazy ride that we're on right now. Wow. So you, you talked about community and you talked about starting small. So let me just ask you, approximately how many people are in what you consider to be your community? And then I'm sure, I'm guessing that it might have some ripple effects. So what would you think when I, if I asked you how many people are actively engaged and how many people are maybe even affected by what's going on with you? You know, I, I don't want to exaggerate or blow any numbers up. I think right now we're, we're directly touching maybe 10 people, you know, and, 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 and for me, that's actually a little too much for, for, for what we're able to do right now. But there is a ripple effect there. You know, if, if, if we're working with either folks on a one-on-one -on -one basis or they're part of our circles. Um, when they leave that space, there's definitely an impact at home. You know, there's definitely an impact on, 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 on what that person is gonna do back in, in their part of the community. And, and, and so that's one of our real hopes is that, and that's happened that they go and, and, and talk about the experience of, of being seen because that's really the, I think the place that we come from is our faith, you know, and we're all, we're all men of faith. You know, we, we, we have different practices and, and, and we, we follow different um, paths of spirituality, um, but we, all three of us believe in, 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 in a creator and a higher power in, in, in one God. And, 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 and we all believe that that God is, is, is who calls us to this work, to build community with people. And, and, and the message really for us when we sit down in circles, when we sit down one-on-one -on -one is um, you, 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 you are somebody, you matter. You're, you're exactly what God intended you to be. And, and those are all things that, you know, I, I've learned from Father Greg. I've learned from, from Kyle. He's a pastor. So these are things, and Miguel has taught me so much. He's a native man that follows the red road, follows native spirituality. And so these are all things that they've taught me is, you know, um, there's such incredible power when you let people know that you see them and, and that they're, they're, they're okay right where they're at at that moment. And, and I'm not saying people don't need to take steps, but it's about, I see you and I'm, 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 I'm going to come to you and I'm not going to hold your hand, but I am going to walk alongside you because I know the path. I've already walked the path. Mm -hmm. So I, I will lead you along and I will walk alongside you. I'm not going to hold your hand. Um, I've learned that too. Um, that most folks don't want to be enabled. They don't want to be a, seen as a charity case. Um, I really believe in, 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 in society moving away from a charity model when we um, talk about helping folks. Um, I really believe in, 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 in helping people help themselves. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and for us, what we can do at this moment in time for Restoring is help people see themselves, help them understand that redemption is possible. And that has a lot to do with who me and Miguel are. Right. And, and not to exclude Kyle, but we and, and, and me and Miguel is the we that I'm talking about right now. We've walked that path. We've been incarcerated. We were part of gangs for a really long time. And so when we're able to, to tell folks, we see you. We want to walk alongside you. And we've already been on that side of the path. And we've been on the other side of the path. And, 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 and we want to help you walk this path now. 
Um, so you, this, you talked about those, I'm sorry to interrupt, you talked oh, about the speaking circles, mm -hmm. and I have a feeling that that's really central to what you're doing. So can you, can you tell me what they are and how they work and why that, why that's tied up in this whole identity narrative and kinship? Right. So, you know, the speaking circles for us really come um, from a place of, of native practices um, and, and, and and, and, and by native and indigenous, I don't mean just here in the Americas. Um, circles have been a, a part of, 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 of humanity since I believe the beginning of time. People have been gathering around fires um, since, they, since they could, right? And, and there's power in something that, that I believe has happened over the millennia. Um, and so we've just simply adapted that practice, which for us is in a circle. Um, where people share an experience. So the circles we run are, are right now are for men that have experienced incarceration. That's the caveat. You know, you, you got to have experienced incarceration. You got to be a man. Um, and really, it's a space where we can talk about things that we can't talk about in any other space in a way that we can't talk about in any other space. And so we're talking about some men that were incarcerated for 30 years and have been out six months. We're talking about some men that um, have been out 10 years and were incarcerated for 10 years. Um, all types of different levels of kind of, um, of timelines there. But like I said, the shared experience is what really brings the power to the circle where we're able to talk, learn from one another. Um, and I think talk in a way where we can't talk in, in any other place, you know. Um, men often talk about that. They will say in the circles, you know, I can't have these kind of conversations at work. Nobody knows I was incarcerated. We got some professional men on there and they say, but I need a space where I can talk about some of the things that still trigger me, some of the things that, you know, I still remember, some of the things that I, I'm still traumatized by that I experienced in prison, um, that, I experienced as a result of violence that I committed or violence that was committed against me. Um, and so we're able to talk about that in, in those spaces and build that community that Restoring is, is really about. Um, a lot of things happen um, in that space that, that um, for me wouldn't happen in any other space. It's very healing for me. I, I don't lead the circles, Miguel does. I'm really just another participant when I, when I do attend the circle. For me, um, I have to wear a lot of different hats in the community. I, I got a bunch of professional hats, but I'm still a guy that spent 13 years of his life incarcerated. Mm -hmm. I'm still a guy that resorted to violence for a lot of his life. I'm still a guy that um, was dealt a lot of violence um, mm -hmm. throughout a lot of his life. And a lot of that stuff is still with me. I still need to be able to talk to to other people that have gone through similar experiences to continue my healing process. Cause I'm still healing just cause I spent 10 years at homeboy industries and I've done a bunch of professional work. I've been, you know, to the white house a bunch of times, all this different stuff doesn't mean that I'm healed. It just means that I'm, I'm in a process of healing. And I believe that that's continuous. I can't even imagine, you know, things that happen to a nine year old or a 10 year old ever being out of your existence, out of your mind, out of your soul, out of your life. But uh, let me ask you, can you tell us more about those three, what those three letters mean? The words identity, narrative, and kinship, those are words, but what do they really mean to you and the people in your community? You know, identity, narrative, and kinship, those are three things that, you know, based on our experience and, 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 um, and other folks that we've talked to, those are three things that really are lost when someone joins a gang, when someone is incarcerated, right? Um, you lose your, your identity. You lose who you really are. As a nine-year-old child that got jumped into a gang at nine years old, I lost my identity as a nine-year-old. I became a gang member. At nine years old, I lost that identity of a child. I wasn't a child anymore. I was a I was a, a a gang member that happened to be nine years old, that did many many things at the age of nine, at the age of ten, at the age of eleven, that were totally against the story that my creator had written for me, 
right? I deviated from that story. I lost it. So we believe that the first thing people need to, to reclaim, to restore is their own story, you know, their, their identity. Um, and, and, and alongside that is the narrative the, 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 that we build and that society built for us. So I, I wasn't a child anymore to society. I became this criminal. I became this person that could be demonized. And, and, and so that became the narrative for Jose. That became the narrative for Miguel when he got jumped into the gang at 10 years old. It, he stopped being a child to himself and to society. You know, and, and, and when we lose that connection in that way with society, we lose that connection, that sense of kinship, right? And so when we're able to restore someone's identity, when we give them back who they are, when we say, here's a path to where you can find yourself and reclaim who the creator created you to be, we then allow them to reclaim their story, their narrative. And as a community, we want to help them do that. And that's where the kinship comes in. Because once we establish that connection, then there's no way we can't step into that sacred thing called kinship. Well, I'm guessing, too, there's, there's always a, a bit of a conflict, perhaps, between wh what your identity really is and what your narrative really is. I remember in your conversation with Sara, you mentioned going to the Boys and Girls Clubs. Mm -hmm. And doing other things that, you know, that were totally um, not necessarily aligned with what a gang member would do and would be encouraged to do in that world. So you had one foot in one world, maybe another foot in another world. And is that the kind of thing that people still experience no matter what stage of life they're in, if they've had some of those experiences? I think there can always be a piece of that. Um, I definitely still feel that, you know, sometimes I, I feel very conflicted when I walk into a room and when, when we're able to walk into rooms, you know, um, especially rooms full of people of power and, 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 and position and all of those things, <clears throat> there's still a part of me that feels inadequate. <clears throat> there's still a part of me that feels like running back to that guy that I used to be back to, you know, the, the, the gang member back to all those things. But that's part of the process that's continuous for me, where I just have to look at my own life. You know, the, the last decade has not been the life of a gang member. The last 10 years have been the life of a productive member of the community. Someone that has tried to do everything that they can to make amends to the community that they damaged. And so I gotta, I gotta, I have to remind myself all the time of my real story today. Well, I think you, you could call yourself a success story. I mean, none of us is a finished product until it's all over, but we're all a work in progress. But at this stage of your life, sounds like a success story to me. Do you have others in your community that you could cheer on and give a shout out to and describe for us, perhaps? Absolutely. I, I, I you know, what I've done is, 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 is really been being in the right place at the right time. I've been a very fortunate man. Um, since I decided to do things right, God has blessed me, right? But I, I, I think I'd love to just briefly talk about one of the first people that we got to help a couple of years ago. And what we did to help this person was very minimal. But I wanna give them a shout out um, because it's very relevant to the process of healing for me. Um, you know, when I was a young gang member, um, one of the, the big rival gangs that we had was, was a Samoan gang um, here in Long Beach. And, you know, one day Miguel called me from, from Homeboy and he goes, hey, I got this guy here, he's from Long Beach and, and he just needs to build community, he needs some help. He, he, he'll tell you about his situation. And so that's how I met this, this beautiful man named June. <clears throat> he's a Samoan man and he had just finished serving 18 years, you know, and, what June ended up doing was he had gotten married. He didn't end up uh, going out to, to the Bay Area up north with his wife because when he was released because his mother was very ill here in Long Beach and he ended up having to take care of her. And this caused him a lot of stress and he wanted to act out. And we sat down and we started to have a few conversations with June. And because we were able to build a little bit of community with June, have dinner with him a couple of times, take some food out to his house, because he was taking care of his, of his ill mother, um, 
June didn't reoffend. He he talked about it a lot with me. He wanted to commit crimes. He wanted to commit violence. He wanted to do these things. Um, but because there were other folks in us that said, no, we felt that too, but we haven't done that. He was able to get through that. And, and then he moved up north. And now he's up there. You know, he has a great job up there with the Department of Water and Power. Um, his, his, he, he, you know, he's with his wife. He's with his children. And what I want to say about that is, first of all, I'm glad that we were there for June. But what was the success there for me was the fact that these two cultures came together, actually three, because Kyle was, was part of this, you know, um, three cultures came together. Um, people that have very different beliefs came together to help this man. And he took advantage of that support and didn't reoffend. And to a lot of people that might mean very little, right? Like, wow, that's great. But when we realized that the recidivism rate for people that are released in California is over 65%. You know, those little moments where someone has a choice to make, whether they reoffend or not, are critical. And so for me, that's that's one of the things that I wanna shout out is, is someone like June that says, I lived this life of a tough guy all my life, but right now I just really need some help. That's all, I just need an ear. I just need someone to, to sit with me and talk with me and, 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 and build community with me. And because of that, Things are the way they are for June. And I'm really glad for that. I'm really grateful that that's what is the outcome for June. I'm going to mention that something that I think I've found on your website. It said there are currently very limited programming in the city of Long Beach that specifically targets the gang impacted in re-entry communities. I'm reading this. The city of Long Beach is the second largest of LA County's um, incorporated cities in the LA County Probations is currently supervising 12,000 state parolees and 60,000 adult probationers. And they have up to 400 parole hearings a month. And 16% of the prisoners who had hearings in 2016 were seen as fit for parole compared with 119 or less than 2% in 2007 and on and on and on like that. So the, the gist of all this to me is that the need is tremendous. And from what I'm hearing about what you're doing, doesn't it make you want to just expand? And it does. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, for me, and, 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 and Kyle knows this, like I'm, I'm a very big vision kind of guy. Um, but Here's, there's a couple of challenges there, right? Um, and and I'm, a, I'm a straight shooter, I'm very straight. Um, I've lived in Long Beach for a long time. I've done a lot of different pieces of work here. It's very hard to work with the city. Um, it's very hard to get things funded if you're, um, we're not a full 501c3, so that has its limitations. We're under a, a fiscal sponsorship under a, a Lutheran organization. Mm -hmm. um, so that has its limitations, um, but really, we're just at that space where for us, it's about building trust, right? With this community that, that, that we get to work with. Um, and that takes, a, that takes time. You know, Father Gray started Homeboy Industries and he had a lot of resistance from the community. He had resistance from gang members. And the only reason that he was able to grow that organization from him working out of the, 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 the office in the rectory at the church to what it is today, this, this huge, you know, 20, maybe now going on $30 million a year organization with 400 staff members and all this stuff is he, he had to build trust with that community for such a long time. It took him at least 10 years to get to a place where gang members told each other, if you need help and you really want to change, go talk to Father Gray. And so that's really the stage that we're at right now. Um, and that doesn't fit what is out there as far as grants, that doesn't fit what's out there as far as what people want for programming, what people want as far as data, evidence-based programming. I've been part of big orgs, so I know all these things have value, right? But we have intentionally chosen not to pay attention to those things, the way Father Greg didn't pay attention to them at the very beginning. Um, he still hates dealing with data and grants and all of that kind of stuff, right? 
Um, and I'm starting to understand why. But we're not going to let that stop us from building community, which is our true intention. Um, sometimes that takes very little effort on our part, just answering a phone call, sitting down with someone at dinner, having a circle in Zoom, or th there are things that don't take a lot, but they have a deep impact when they're done right. They have a deep impact when you're able to build trust. So that's why we're really limiting ourselves on saying, yes, we want to grow and we want to serve, you know, 5,000 people a year. No. Well, it's, it sounds like you're doing things that are heart to heart, hand to hand, individual to individual. And that's not something that is, to use a word that's popular nowadays, scalable. Mm -hmm. It's not something that, that can be um, put into a diagram and an org chart. And if you can check all the boxes for all the funding requirements that you have. So I hear you. I understand. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to open it up to questions in a few minutes, but I, I do want to ask, how do you find the people who are going to be part of your community? How do you know who to open the door to, who to bring in and who to say yes to or who to reach out to? How does that happen? I, I'm, I'm going to give you a very simple answer and I'll elaborate on it a little bit, but we let God do that work. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's really what I believe. It happens in all, ki all kinds of different ways. When, when Kyle was living in the Drake Park area, all he had to do was stand, you know, outside in his front yard or sit on his porch and homies, gang members would pass by. And he started to build relationship with them and tell them, do you want to come to, to, to this, you know, um, prayer session in my house? Do you want to go talk to Jose about some workforce stuff? Um, really just very grassroots and who, right? Like who? Um, there is no, there is no limitation. There's no nothing that will tell me do not work with this person, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other day we, I'll give you an example. We had a, we had a speaking circle and um, one of the men had just suffered a great loss a great loss, a tremendous loss in his life. And, and he showed up inebriated to the circle, right? And a lot of places would have asked this person to leave, whether it was in person or virtually, right? Instead, we said, we're here for you. And what do you need from us? And if you needed to just kind of blabber for an hour and a half with us, which is what ended up happening for most of that session. That's what we did because we knew that for those 90 minutes, that man was okay. He was not going to hurt himself and he was not going to hurt others. And he would go away from that space knowing that someone was willing to listen. And we called the next day and the day after, and, and, and we finally got him to slow down. Um, I got to check on him later on today. But really, that's that's how it happens, you know. And 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 we we welcome that. That's really what I think we're about. Is however God chooses to put someone in our path that we can serve, we're going to serve them if we're able to. Well, it's a bit like you never know what's going to happen tomorrow, and you never really know who's going to come across your path, who's going to walk in that door, and how that interaction is going to go. You can't anticipate it, can you? And it's, yeah, and it's not linear either. It's not something that's straight. You know, there, there's, there's some young men that Kyle has been working with for, for a few years now. And, you know, we've worked with them in different spurts and different stages. You know, we've, we've, we've had sit downs with them. I, I, I've done some workforce development with, with, this, with, with some of them. And some of them, you know, they've gone through those different things and then they end up incarcerated. And, and now we're working with them that way. Kyle is writing them. Kyle is working with their families a little bit, seeing how we can support them. Because it's not about, oh, you got locked up. We can't serve you anymore. You know, it's about you're part of our community. How can we support you now? The situation may be different. And the way we support you is going to be different. But we're not going to stop supporting you because you're part of a community. You're not part of a program that has a, 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 an end 
or has some outcome that then you graduate from. No, this is just about building community, supporting people, seeing them for who they are, and, and, and really helping them become the best version of themselves. So it's there's no application form and no exit interview, right? <laughs> Not yet, not yet. And I hope there never is, honestly. I hope there never is. Right, right. Okay, one last question from me and then I'm gonna open it up to the rest of the crew here. Um, what what are some of the greatest, and I this is a wide open-ended question, so you can throw whatever you want to in there. What are some of the greatest challenges that you face at Restore Inc. with this endeavor? I think, a couple of big challenges. So I think first and foremost is the is the narrative that has been you know established around gang members, around people that have experienced incarceration, uh, getting you know people in positions of power, getting just you know community members to understand that at the end of the day we're not that different. Mm -hmm. You know, um, at the end of the day, I, you know, I do a bunch of different stuff. Uh, a few years ago, I did a big training up, up in Central California for a bunch of, of members of law enforcement. And, you know, a cop asked me, how can I ever relate to you? And how can you ever relate to me, right? And, and, I, and I answered his question in a very simple way. Um, I asked him, when you get up and you leave your house, to come and do your job, to do your job as a police officer, do you pray? And he said, yes. I said, what do you pray for? He said, I pray for my family and I pray that I come home safely to my family. And I told him every day when I get up in the morning and I do my prayers, I pray for those two same exact things. So already we have something in common. We both live lives through some decisions we've made, whether they're the job that we take or a lifestyle that we ended up living, we both have these lives where our lives are at risk and we just wanna be safe for our families. I go, and that's just in three minutes that we had a conversation. I said, imagine if we talked some more, how many different things we would have in common. So getting folks to, to understand that at the end of the day, did I really make a choice when I was nine years old and I got jumped into a game? Was that a real choice? You know, and that's a choice that at nine years old, unfortunately, I've had to live for with the rest, for, live with it for the rest of my life. Of course, if I could go back to nine-year-old Jose, I would tell him, don't do this. I did a podcast with my daughter the other day and I told her, what would you tell nine-year-old dad? What would you tell nine-year-old Jose? And she told me a very simple answer. She goes, I'm a mom now, so I know what I would tell you. I would tell you, go home, go home, you know? And so that's, that's what I wish people would understand, you know, um, that we're not the, 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 the worst choice we made in our life. That's not who we are. We're not the worst thing we did in our life. That's not who we are. I have to say that a lot of what I'm hearing reminds me so much of the things I've read in, in Father Boyle's, Father Greg's books. Tattoos on the heart, barking to the choir, some of those things. It just, it resonates. I mean, I'm a good student. Real. I'm a good student of his. Yeah, <laughs> it's real. It's real. Yeah. Okay. I've got a couple of questions here in the chat. One says, uh, I'm a pastor. I'm retired. I'm a police chaplain. What can a church in Seal Beach do to assist a ministry like yours? Uh, what would you say to Don? I, I would say this. Um, I would, I would, one of the things that I love doing is building community with people, period. You know, and, and one of the things that Father Greg had me do a lot of when I worked for him um, was go out to congregations and, and just tell my story, talk about the work. And, 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 and that allows people to start to, to see things a little bit differently, to see people like me a little bit differently. You know, so that's one of the things that I think that congregations can do is, is, is open the doors, you know, to have a conversation like this, have, have, have folks listen, have, have folks ask questions. Father Greg would often tell me, let people get to know you, Jose, because people rarely demonize who or what they know. 
they always demonize what they don't know and what they don't understand. So just let people get to know you because you're, you're, you, I love you. And if I love you, I think that other people will too, if they really get to know the Jose that I've gotten to. So that's one thing that I would offer. Open the doors and have those conversations, you know, um, let people tell their stories, let people ask questions. And, and that's a two-way thing, you know, I love to go and ask questions at churches and synagogues and, 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 and mosques. I've, I've, I've spoken at all of them, and, and those were some of the greatest experiences I've, I've had in my life. You have, you have time to do that, and how do people reach you? I'll, I'll, I'll put my, they get, I'm, I'm on the website, but I'll put it all on, on, on here as well, too, before, we, uh, before we, we end the session. I'll put my contact. Okay, but cool. When, Sarah, whenever I do have the time, it's something that, that I do. Miguel loves doing that. We love doing it together. You know, it's a very unique story, two guys that, you know, one initiated the guy into, into the gang and, and, and then they both ended up working for Father Greg and, and, and then they both end up starting a little baby organization and try to, trying to make amends to the community that they hurt. Mm -hmm. Sarah's got her hand up. Sarah, will you please uh, ask your, unmute yourself and ask your question. Good afternoon. Greetings of peace, Marietta and Brother Jose. So good to see you here today. Likewise, sister. I'm like, I'm like trying to get myself to like boil it down to like one or two questions, <laughs> but I have so much to, to, to ask you about. You used a term earlier, tough guy. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what a tough guy is. What are the implications of that title or what it represents? And then how does a tough guy move towards redemption, whether it's bringing oneself to be right with God and also um, re to repair harm that's been done. You mentioned like returning to Long Beach because you felt that you had, I don't want to put words in your mouth, you said something about causing harm in that town and wanting to come back. How does a tough guy, um, that it's not easy, um, if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think my definition of a tough guy has evolved. Right. I think that's part of, of, of has been part of my work has been really helping myself redefine that and helping others redefine that. Right. Because a tough guy used to be that guy, that person that was out in the streets, that that was consistently fighting, that 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 could do hard prison time, you know, um, all of those things. And. I've learned that that's not a tough guy at all, you know, um, for me now, I really define a tough guy by someone like June that faces life and all the difficulties um, without reoffending, without hurting anybody, without hurting themselves. Um, I learned that, you know, the gang life and committing crimes, you know, a lot of that, the community had a lot to do with. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, let the community off the hook. You know, at nine years old, a lot of things happened to me and, and, and other people of color in my community, other poor people of color in my community um, that we had no control over, right? Um, but those, a lot of those choices were very easy choices once I became a grown man, once there were choices that I could have took the tough decision and, and not committed a crime. I could have made that tough decision and, and not hurt somebody that day. Um, and so now I understand that not doing those things is tough. It's hard, but it's what I have to do. And that's kind of the message we try to give the other people um, that we get to work with is, and there is a certain toughness that you get from having to live the life that we live, right? Take that toughness, redefine it, use it for something positive. That's what I, my, my, my son's murder was, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was painful. It was painful. It hurt. It still hurts. But it's the driving factor for me. It's the motivator at the end of the day when nothing else works. When Jose has given it on, he's ready to, 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 to give up. I think about that. I think about the fact that I've outlived my son. My son was killed at the age of 17. You know, I've, I've outlived, I've lived more than double his life. And how dishonorable would it be to continue to live the way I live when he was murdered? Um, for me, that, that, that's, that's why I, I stay strong. And, 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 and now I say, I'm a tough guy now. I'm a tough guy. 
you know, um, because I make a lot of, of choices that are really hard, but at the end of the day, they're the right choices. Um, but I get a lot of support. That's the other thing. It's, it's, it's easy to make a choice, but we got to be ready. I'll tell you that right now, Sana. Um, I'm glad that when I made a choice to change my life, Father Greg was there. Because if he wasn't, I don't know where I would be today. That's why we try to have things in place, partnerships. If somebody needs things that we can't give, which are a lot, right? We go to other orgs. We go to Homeboy Industries. We go to some of the orgs here in Long Beach and tell them, can you help this person? Or we'll go outside of Long Beach. Whatever we need to do to make sure that when somebody's ready to change, the things are in place for them to change. Because that's a very fickle thing that can change at any moment, you know? I'm going to ask another question from the, the chat, um, unless Rabia wants to uh, just unmute and ask, but it's, um, do you want to, or shall I read what you put in the chat, Rabia? You can read it. I'm sorry. That's very long. Um, that's okay. <laughs> it says, thank you for sharing your story, Jose. And it's wonderful to hear how building connection and providing support helps those that are entering community. And she was wondering if you would be interested in having regular AVP, that's Alternatives to Violence Project workshops for the community that you build and are continuing to build. And because they're very interested uh, in working with groups focusing on reentry. And I'll open it up too to another question that's related and that is, are there other groups or other organizations, other programs that you use as resources and take advantage of? So there are. So like I said, you know, we, we refer a lot of folks out um, to Homeboy Industries, like around um, workforce development pieces, things like that. Um, around housing, we've got a couple of organizations, and that usually happens through treatment. So I've got a, a decent relationship with a lot of the folks over at Lakata, which is a substance abuse organization that has a footprint here in Long Beach. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll connect folks through there. Um, we also done some work with Centro Cha here in Long Beach um, around helping uh, transition age youth get into, you know, like um, job training, workforce development, things like that as well. Um, but um, Robbie, I'd, I'd love to, to have a, 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 a deeper conversation with you at some time. Please reach out to me. Sure, um, I will. Because that's something that we would definitely love to, to talk about you with. Absolutely. Okay, all right. Jose, Jose's been kind enough to put his email in the chat box. So if you have other questions, you wanna reach out to him, he's making himself available for you to communicate with him, which is- Absolutely. That's his style. So, uh, Sorry, did you say you had another question you wanted to chime in? I've got a couple more, but please go ahead. Sure, um, I have two more. <laughs> uh, so one question um, has been, uh, per, you know, per in my head over the last week, um, I was in a space where folks who represent victims and were understandably talking about justice and healing and expressing the sentiment that there are some people that are just beyond redemption that should not be returned to community or to public spaces, um, that, that there are some people that commit such violent acts that they're not capable of changing their nature or walking away from violence. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is a person's is, is a person who commits a violent act intrinsically violent? Is that a quality that's permanent and doesn't change and adjust? Or how would you how how do you understand that idea or concept? This is another space where a lot of that I leave up to God. Mm -hmm not my decision that's that's my faith tells me that my faith tells me that i am no one to decide the the fate of someone's life whether that means um you know capital punishment whether that means a a, a death sentence through a life sentence where you're never gonna be released and you're gonna die in prison um those are the things that we're talking about i do not believe and my faith tells me and i, and I say this because i know i'm in a space with with people of faith. My faith tells me that my creator can redeem anybody that seeks it, anybody. 
and, and sometimes even those that don't, right? Um, and so I would say that no one is beyond the reach of, 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 of redemption. Um, and that's coming from a man who arrived at the, at the scene of his son's murder and, 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 and saw the two bullet holes that were put in his head. Um, and, and today I tell you this, I, I, my most fervent desire in that situation is that the two men that murdered my son have found peace because I can only imagine what turmoil and trauma caused them to find themselves in a situation where they did not value not just my son's life, but their own as well. And so I truly believe that no one is beyond the reach of redemption. I believe that no one deserves a sentence that excludes them from our community permanently. Some of us just didn't get caught is what I'll say to that too. Some of us just didn't get caught. You know, and, and, and so if we knew what some of our neighbors have done mm. and, and, and have worked that out with their creator in whatever way they have, but if we knew what some of our neighbors have done, you know, how would we feel? If we knew what some of our family members have done, what would we feel? You know, and so that's, that's, that's my response to that, sir. I, I don't believe anyone is beyond that reach. I, I, I truly don't. Jose, that, that brings me to my other question. You described your nine-year-old self and you asked, what, did you really have a choice, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking about all the nine-year-olds that are out there right now who are finding themselves at that exact same intersection, what, is, what do you think is our responsibility as communities of faith and conscience? What, what could we be doing so that those nine-year-olds aren't finding themselves with no choices, with no options? I would say there's two things that are very important to me in that, in that dynamic. First of all, understanding what would lead a nine-year-old to find themselves in that situation to begin with and starting to address those things as a community, right? Um, the fact that my mother and my father had to both work two jobs when I was nine years old right, to make ends meet. And because of that, I was by myself and I made a lot of decisions all by myself, right? Those are the things that we gotta look at. Why did those two people have to be away from me so much, right? Why did they have to be away from me so much? Um, that doesn't happen in a lot of other communities. The other thing I would say is we gotta look at the big picture. And, and, and I know that it, we wanna focus on the nine-year-old. And we wanna say like, we gotta help the children, we gotta help the kids. But see, most of those children have brothers, fathers, mothers, sisters, cousins that are older than them, that are in very similar situations and are much farther along. And if we're gonna demonize those folks, right? If we demonize big Jose and little Jose sees that, he's gonna understand, my dad is right, my brother's right. We're not part of them. We're not part of that community. We're right where we belong. And so if we're gonna say, we wanna see little Jose, we have to be willing to see big Jose too, right? In different ways. And there's different ways to support. But I think that's very interconnected. It's very interwoven. Um, if we wanna help out the young people, especially children, we got to look at the big picture and we got to look at how do we address the needs for this entire community? Because gangs, violence, they're a symptom of a, of a disease. And that's what we have to do. Father Greg would often say, if you don't have the right, if you're not calling, if you're not doing the right diagnosis, you're not going to prescribe the right treatment. And so if we don't understand that this is, this is beyond just a family structure thing, Let's remember, I had a mom and a dad, both. I still do. They live next door to me, right? If you, I'll call them over if y'all want, but I still have my mom and dad. I, that wasn't the reason 
the the reason was they weren't available because they were under resourced. They had to work two jobs each because that's just the way things were in that community. And so I think we've got to look at changing the bigger picture while addressing the smaller picture at the same time. I'll say I'm going to ask you one more question because I can't help it. And then I'm going to turn it over to Amelia. But my question is just driving me crazy. What about the women? What about the women who are either in gangs or who are impacted or who have been incarcerated and are being released? I mean, I, I know they're not going to be part of your men's speaking circles, but is there anyone who's thinking about them and working on ways to get give them a voice, a community, a different identity, a different narrative? Absolutely. And that's one of the things that we are exploring as, as uh, restoring, you know, here's the deal. Um, we're three men, right? And so right now what we're doing is really looking at building relationship with a couple of women that have both the professional experience and the lived experience of being incarcerated, or being in gang impacted to be the facilitators for the circle. So it's something we, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you, Marietta, it's one of the things that we know is a huge need and we want to do it right. So that's actually one of the things we're in the middle of is talking to a few women about starting a speaking circle for women. Oh, that warms my heart and gives me hope. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we're kind of at the end of our program and I want to turn it over to Amelia, if you're available, Amelia, to just kind of wrap it up for us. Tell us a little bit about what's ahead for South Coast Interfaith Council and... Um, if you have any other words for Jose. All right, thank you so much, Marietta. Brother Jose, thank you so much. It's so clear that you speak from your heart. And this is something that it's, it's, it's not what you do, it's who you are. And so we're so grateful for your, the inspiration that you are to so many people, you know, and, and we, we pray and we continue to pray that your work gets bigger and reaches farther people and, uh, and that it's something that grows in partnership with so many other organizations as well. So from our heart to yours, thank you so much. And to Pastor Kyle as well, and to, um, uh, I wrote it down, and Miguel, of course, and Miguel. I, I visited your website and so I feel like I know these people. <laughs> and I listened to this, for those of you who haven't listened to this podcast, please do, it's actually available on their website as well. It's beautiful, it really is. Um, so thank you. Thank you again. And, and Marietta, thank you as always for hosting us and for your, that's my little daughter there going crazy in the backyard. <laughs> so, yes, it's past nap time, but I do want to share with some, uh, okay, Where, one second. <laughs> that's a beautiful sound. Okay. All right. Look, look at all the people. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. Um, Cheryl, if I could ask you to share some of the uh, f fires for the upcoming events, I'll talk about that real quick. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, our summer interfaith cafes are, are starting. One second, I'm so sorry. Amelia, do you want us to tell about these upcoming events? We can. Father to the rescue. No, no, her dad got it. Okay. <laughs> yes, he was, I was waiting for him to come in the restroom. Um, so yes, let's refocus. All right. So in the summer months, we have Interfaith Cafes, um, one of our most successful programs. And last year, obviously, we sh shifted from being in physical presence to that over Zoom. And so we continue that this year as well in this summer. So we invite you to be a part of that. Our first one being in May on May 16th, and there's information about that on the on our website as well. And then I think Cheryl, you have a few others, two others. Okay, our Religion 101 continues again. This is something. Um, it ha it's the fourth Thursday of the evening at seven at seven p.m. And again, we're on Zoom uh, like we were last year. And coming up on May 27th, we have both Hinduism and Sikhism an interfaith identity. And it's uh, um, Tahil, he's a really interesting fellow. He identifies himself as both Hindu and Sikh, and he works within the interfaith community. So, um, and he's a great storyteller. So I hope that you can join us for that as well on the 27th. And I think we have one more, Cheryl, am I right? Oh, yes, there you go. So of course, as, as all nonprofits, you know, we, 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 
we essentially survived because of your contributions and your and your kindness. So if you are able to, we ask you to please, um, whatever amount that you're able to give, that you donate what you can. You can do so by going on our website, scinterfaith.org, or you can even text help SCIC to 44321, or you could um, send us a donation in the mail at 525 East 7th Street, Suite 20, A202. So um, any and all contributions, we're so grateful for that. Um, other than that, just thank you again for everyone for being a part of this conversation. Jose, Brother Jose, um, thank you so much again for all that you do and who you are. And Marietta, if there's anything that parting last thoughts that you had, otherwise I think we're good and we'll have a good afternoon. Anything, Marietta? Well, you know, Jose, we're just really, really grateful to you. And I know that this is just the start of more things. People are going to be in touch with you and you're going to be in touch with us. And um, we're just happy that we were able to get this conversation going today. Um, but thank you, everyone, for being part of the conversation and stay in touch. We'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so have a good Everybody afternoon. Have a great one.